The tragedy that occurred last week in Uvalde, Texas is heartbreaking on so many different levels. How to make sense of someone so troubled that he would shoot his own grandmother and then attack and murder defenseless children. How to process the incompetence of a police force unwilling to confront the shooter and possibly save lives. And how does someone that is a dropout from school, ostensibly unemployed, from a broken home, find the means to purchase nearly $4,000 worth of weapons and ammunition? Mark, as we learn more about this case, we find out that there were disturbing signs about the danger of the shooter, Salvador Ramos. He was increasingly becoming a loner. He was involved in self-mutilation, and there is evidence of his being bullied when younger. Now, this is a pattern of individuals involved in other similar incidents. So why is it so hard that they can't be ferreted out before the tragedy? Well, I, you know, I'm reluctant to, with each of these incidents, to try and extrapolate from the facts of, of one individual as sort of a broader trend. So let me put a caveat on that. But I do think it reflects, a, how shall I say, an epidemic of despair. This is beyond just the shooting incident, uh, but it includes the opioid deaths that uh, so many young people uh, seem to be struggling with. And, we need more tools in order to be able to uh, more effectively address them. Yeah, Mike, the, the magnitude of Uvalde tragedy is incomprehensible. And as Mark indicated, there are, are other things that are affecting our youth today. Here in Montgomery County, we're not, you know, we're not uh, immune from the challenge. And recently there was a shooting of a 17 year old at Magruder High School. There was a threat by a student at Winston Churchill High School to shoot up the school. Yesterday, it was reported that over in Virginia, another teen was involved in a shooting. So how prepared are we here in Montgomery County and MCPS in particular going to address these very violent threats? Well, I mean, I think you said it. We, we say this is incomprehensible, and yet we've had how many of these in the last 20 years? So sadly, they're unfortunately very comprehensible because they happen a lot. Um, in Montgomery County, I, the police chief and the county executive and others had a, had a discussion yesterday with the community, and I think we're as prepared as anybody can be. I mean, unfortunately, we had the following on the heels of Columbine in 99, we had the sniper incident in Montgomery County. And so I think we as a community have thought about how you harden a facility and how you deny access to a school. And we have very significant limitations as to who, who can and who can't get in. And so I think, and, we, and I think we have a police department and school community that works closely together. We've had a lot of active shooter drills. So, I mean, I think we're as, a, as prepared as anybody can be. That being said, I don't think anybody's prepared. Um, I think it becomes pretty clear that if somebody gets a military style automatic automatic weapon or semi automatic weapon and they decide they want to go in some place and shoot people. Um, it's right really easy for them to get access to that weapon and it's really hard to stop them when they when they get underway. Well, yeah, it is and but the troubling trend and I and I guess I'm, I'm more concerned about the troubling trend as we see and uh, what I think is an epidemic of depression and drug abuse by our, our teens, uh, the expanded use of, of opioids and fentanyl in particular. It, mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that we have a root fundamental issue dealing with um, our young people and, and finding out uh, why they are becoming so frustrated and unhappy. Now, and Mark, you know, compounded with this, we hear there's a, an increased need for counseling, but is that going to be sufficient? Well, I mean, counseling can, can help identify problems, but obviously the, the broader resources in which um, disaffected individuals, and that's right, one of the common denominators that you see through so many of these incidents, who are not as socially integrated into the community with, with their peers uh, can be reconnected. And counseling can help that process, but um, there really are broader, you know, it's, it's broader than what one therapist or can, can be able to handle. It's, it's something which as a society we can be able to address. Well, I mean, that's the issue. I mean, you know, as a, there's been a societal breakdown, I think that, 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 that we've seen that, you know, 
is is hard to put into the context. I don't want to say there's a breakdown in overall morality, but there's certainly a breakdown in our society. You know, of, of functions, our institutions, our religious our religious institutions are being challenged and broken down. You know, churches weren't allowed to uh, congregate during you know in person during during the COVID pandemic. I mean, all of these things I think have gone into it. Plus, I think the, the disastrous negative effects of the internet. I mean, this young man that was allegedly being bullied on the internet, um, and as well as being bullied at school. And we've seen this time and time again, that internet bullying has a, has a direct a detrimental effect on people and it causes them to be depressed. Um, it, it does, but, but I, and I think that we've, and we've talked about this on this show, we clearly have to provide additional resources for mental health. Um, it can't be something that the school is alone forced to address. Um, I've seen a number of articles with how, to, how are our schools going to cope. The reality is that this is not a, just a school issue. This is a community issue. It's a societal issue. It's a parental issue. Um, and so we've got to provide resources more globally and think very differently about how we provide mental health resources. But the other piece is you cannot have a conversation about this without talking about access to weapons. We have four, 400 million weapons in this country. We have 80 million more weapons than we do individual people if every person had a weapon. And so you have to think that a, a person of his age has seen this happen many, many, many times over the last 20 years. And so if I don't have a good frame of reference to make decisions in the first place, and I look at how I lash out, I look at the examples of school shootings and mass shootings that have taken place as a way that that happens because I can readily access a weapon. And so at some point, we've got to have a conversation about how you address the mental health piece, but you cannot go, you cannot ignore the supply of weapons piece either. Well, in, in conjunction with that, we up in Baltimore, the mayor has announced that they are filing a lawsuit against go, these alleged ghost gun manufacturers uh, who sell kit guns uh, mm -hmm. that individuals can, can put together. But the fact is, until we have a change in our laws, you know, an 18 year old is able to go and, and purchase these types of, of, of weapons and do so legally. Now, there are, there's another epidemic of illegal guns that are on that are in the marketplace that are being used by criminals to commit other types of crime, and that's not the purpose of this this segment right now. We want to talk about the, this incident at, at uh, the Uvalde School in Texas. But I mean, yes, access to guns is is an issue. But you know, the counterbalance is we do have we you know the Second Amendment. Which, which allows individuals to own weapons and not and as part of their constitutional rights. Well, and, and one of the, the conversation that we can kind of have is, is as Mike mentioned, uh, uh, guns are fairly widespread. The number of households with guns in the United States um, is <laughs> very high and that's not likely to change and not going to change. Uh, the, the appropriate thing, too, is to consider the fact that one of the, the takeaways that some people from these incidents is that the self-protection um, element of having a gun, of, of being armed, uh, it, it, it's a function if you're not in a highly dense urban area and you expect you don't necessarily expect the police are going to come anytime as soon as in an incident, uh, people want to have the right to defend themselves. Um, they, they do, and I, and I understand and appreciate that, and yet in a situation in a state where that's clearly a part of the ethos, in a state where police responded with, with weapons in a time to try to do something, in a place where all of those things theoretically should have been put in place to be able to stop this person faster, 21 people lost their lives. And so I think it certainly calls into question whether or not that, that, that approach is, is, is an appropriate approach and actually gets the outcome that people expect that it gets. Unless so, you're going to have ten-year-olds we've, we've, we've got to loading guns to school. We've got to end this segment. But here's the conundrum, Mike and, and Mark. In in Buffalo, New York, and the state of New York has the most heavily regulated firearms law in the country. It didn't prevent a similar tragedy mm -hmm. from someone going into a, a grocery store and shooting and killing, killing and maiming people. So right. this it's 
So we've got, to, we've got to look at an underlying root cause because clearly people can access the weapons and we've got to figure out a way to, 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 to come up with a different approach to, to regulating that. All right, well, we, have to, we, have to, we have to move on. Thank you both. Uh, great, great topic and great, great discussion on this very difficult topic. When we come back from this short break, a 1951 Silver Spring starter home is listed for a lot of money. Who the heck can afford that right now? Stay tuned.